trade. And Michael Kreil is an expert for data analysis and data visualization, and he very intensely uh, looked into how it came about that people that you thought would be very rational um, out of a sudden uh, radicalized uh, up to right-wing extremism. Two years ago, he gave a talk about fake news uh, and filter bubbles, and uh, a lot of the things he's going to tell right now um, is uh, going to point to that. So take a look at that previous talk and have a big hand for Michael. Yeah, good morning. Uh, well, I made a trap for you. Um, uh, I wrote internet about my talk so uh, that people show up at all. Uh, actually, it's about racism in society that I want to talk about. So two years ago, I gave a talk about what effects we find on the internet in filter bubbles, uh, echo chambers, fake news and so on. And uh, a lot of people uh, from uh, uh, extremism research, from social sciences, um, psychology, political sciences, talk to me. Uh, how could you explain that, what has happening in the internet there? Uh, and is this the cause or is it an effect of something? And the bad news is, well, I think it's a symptom and it's not the cause of it. And in the previous two years, I have looked at several research projects. I've looked at right-wing extremism, at racism, and how does it interconnect to certain media. And well, mainly the question is, what effects are relevant, and what's the cause of them, and what's the effect, so how to tell those apart. So. To take an example with what bullshit topics you have to deal with is the topic of social bots that would radicalize society. Uh, I gave a talk in Bulgaria on the Open Fest, the army that never existed, the failure of social bot research. And there's an URL and my lecture notes are on GitHub, the URL is there. So I hope the talk is online in the next couple of days. It's in English and it's, um, it's a summary who is doing research and on what catastrophic methods of research all the research uh, is built upon. Um, the, study, the research is contradictory, there is very, very uh, strange opinions on that, and it's bullshit all over, and it's accepted by uh, scientific papers, uh, by, by journals, it's, uh, well, it's rubbish. If you look at the topic of racism and see how it does interact with internet, we have to talk about what is racism. So, and I found if I talk to people about racism, there is different ideas what racism actually is. Um, one reason for that is that it's, well, it's a very complex phenomenon. It has to do with uh, sociology, um, political sciences, um, and we are doing research right now. Up to this day, we are finding new interconnections, and we find it's even more complicated than we thought it was. And that means in social sciences, there's um, different views on what is racism actually and what is it not. And I know it's annoying, but it's important to look at the discourse. Uh, normally, if I talk to people, okay, um, okay, it's based on a theory of race, where you um, divide uh, people into groups to justify violence uh, from top uh, to bottom. Um, you think about uh, violent youth, but, um, you know, the, uh, the term um, was coined at the beginning of the 20th century, but it's really old. So if you look to the uh, antique times, um, you, would for, uh, um, you would say foreigners are barbarians and slave trade uh, was also racism based and African uh, people uh, were thought of as being um, uh, underprivileged. And so um, there was race, there was prevalent racism for thousands of years, even if it wasn't called like that. 
saying racial the it's racial uh, theory of race well that's uh, that's not really true because um, the actual the, this theory as a scientific discipline was not a valid thing to deal with and so it was rather a racism of the scientists instead of being a theory of race and it was a pseudo-science thing to legitimate uh, racism. So, we can do away with this. Uh, it's not just separating people into races. That is not uh, something that we can uh, base anything on. And, of course, we know that even Nazis would not do a DNA test. They would just go to um, ethnic origin, uh, to your citizenship, to your religious beliefs, that's something where you would separate people um, into groups. Yeah. Even violence is not a central element of racism. It's um, also... And we can see the basic concept is about using particular markers to define groups, um, and you're using that to claim that particular groups are inferior and to essentially put them down. Um, as a graphic example, I made a, a table with different lines, and um, oh no, so uh, in horizontally you have different types of uh, discrimination, and vertically you have different markers based on which things are being you can be discriminated. Um, sometimes uh, you would just talk about racism as part of racism. Some people say insults are, in my opinion, all of this is racism. So it re reaches all the way to positive stereotypes. Um, and that's something that we've also known for quite a while. This is also written down in the basic law um, from 1949, which says nobody can be discriminated, c can be discriminated against or treated in, in a pre preferentially based on their gender, where they're from, their race, their language the place of, of their origin or their religious belief or their political belief. Um, there's, a similar, there's a similar agreement on this definition in the UN Convention against the for the Elimination of Racism. Um, all of these are forms of racism that includes the positive parts. And so, so one thing that's, I think, notable is that the German Basic Law also names gender as the basis for discrimination. Um, because if we go back uh, to the slide about the definition where we say, uh, well, what if mention, uh, if people are divided into inferior and superior groups based on their gender, um, that's basically sexism. And then we can see that there's a surprising intersection between racism and sexism because the mechanism is basically the same. And you can expand this even further. Um, I made an entire list. Um, there's anti-Semitism, sexism, racism, um, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, uh, xenophobia towards people from uh, who are Arab, um, class classism against people from particular parts of society ageism against people who might be older and who cannot get a line of credit anymore, homophobia, transphobia, uh, ableism, all of these are important topics. Um, lookism, for, or even there's discrimination based on um, someone's first name. Um, there's serophobia against people who have HIV AIDS. Um, ling there's uh, such a thing as linguism, which is something that I noticed in myself because for a long time I didn't take people seriously who had a Saxonian accent because I only knew that from comedians. But once you start putting yourself into the place of someone who actually lives in Saxony, um, and for them it's just a dialect, then for them it's discrimination. Um, discrimination against people who are homeless, um, discrimination against people who are out of work. These different types of discrimination are emphasized in different ways and they have different degrees of strength. Someone, just because someone has a first name that gets discriminated against, doesn't experience the same degree of uh, discrimination or danger as someone who is threatened with death or murder. Um, professor Heidmeier, a German sociology professor, came up with the idea of uh, uh, of animosity towards groups of people, which is basically based on group markers. But I agree, obviously, that there are different degrees here, um, but I think it's important to understand the different um, the different mechanisms behind it that are essentially the same. I, but I also think that even Heitmeier's term of group-based um, animosity is also not the best term, because these groups don't actually exist. They're constructed by the people who are perpetrating racism and who are the racists. These people don't actually know each other, and they're just put into a group with each other. So even the group itself is a social construct. Um, and in addition to that, if, for example, 
you see children, um, children uh, who are making anti-Semitic jokes, maybe because, because they're just stupid, um, or may because they don't have like a very, uh, very strong value system. It's hard to call, say that they're. Experience, uh, that they're expressing animosity towards a particular group. So there's another new term that I really like, which is the, oh my God. Um, which is the generalizing construction um, of a rejection. This is the most German term that is in this talk. Um, so basically, you gen generalize about a group of people and then you reject them after you construct the group based on which you reject them. Which is something that you might also recognize from your own thinking. Um, we are told if you don't study for school, you will have to become, uh, you have to get p other people's trash or you will have to clean other people's houses. Um, uh, I got another example, all cops are bastards. That's also one of those generalizing rejection constructs. Um, because you generalize about cops, um, you say all of them are bastards, um, regardless of whether they uh, were born in wedlock or not. So for example, all, there are policemen and members of the police who are against police and against other structural problems in the police. The, they are also being rejected by a statement like this. This is something that you have to realize. Then there is structural racism as well, which also works without racists. Um, here's one example that you may know. There is a person who needs a white paper towel to get soap from a soap dispenser because when he tries to do it with his own hand, it doesn't work because the light sensor ha seems to have a problem with the color of his skin. The engineers who build it obviously aren't racists. Um, they didn't do that on purpose or deliberately. They did that because they did, just didn't think of it. Maybe there's also a mechanism of structure. It's also a measure of structural race racism that there are only white engineers who are working on this, for instance. I'd also never thought of this. For example, when I'm getting um, a plaster, um, that the plaster doesn't have the color of my skin, and what does that look like for people with darker skin? And so there is a person who was walking around, um, and I was like, oh my god, I, ca I didn't even think of how happy people might be to get a plaster in the color of their own skin. One thing that also um, that I encounter repeatedly is that I can go to the Berlin Museum, I can see the bust of Nefertiti, um, I can pay 250 and can see a very important old treasure from Egyptian history. A friend of mine who's actually from Egypt asked me, so um, I asked him, what do you have to do as an Egyptian to go see your own cultural treasure? And then he showed me documents from the German embassy um, basically, the documents that Egyptians need to fill out and submit. So they need to a passport, they need to a bi biometric passport photo, they proof of proof of health insurance, um, proof of a hotel reservation, um, written proof of their flight ticket, chronologic uh, information on their bank accounts and the, the, the amount of money that they have access to, um, pro written proof of employment and for how long they've been uh, employed there. So they're, they're, the list is even longer, I just couldn't keep up, but this is racism. Here are here's a range of other examples, especially researched and published by Tatz, a German newspaper based in Berlin, um, about people who have trouble finding apartments. Um, the first example is by a Mr. Ming Li, who applied to different apartments in Berlin, um, who next time essentially just applied as Leon Kunze with the same paperwork otherwise, and suddenly he was able to get an apartment. So again, that's something that you can also look into and research systematically. Here Here's a team that looked into uh, job offers and sent two applications to each job offer, one with a Turkish name and one with a German name, and then looked at how many callbacks people got and these different experiments gone. You can kind of look at whether that differs between different sectors, whether that differs between based on the size of the company. But here is basically the biggest example is that um, it's 50% more, more likely to get a callback if your name sounds German. I didn't know that. I hadn't ever even thought about this. Um, because I didn't have to think about this type of discrimination because I don't have a Turkish last name when I apply for a job in Germany. That's also something that you can extend to sexism. Um, the question of media, how often the media discuss where a perpetrator or a suspect comes from. There is a study by the Media Service for Integration, which is a German organization, which looked at how newspapers report on suspects. On the left side, you see 
uh, where people are from based on the police statistics. Um, so 30% are foreigners, 70% are German. Um, when in terms of reporting, especially on TV, you can tell you can tell that even though only 30% of perpetrators are marked as potential foreigners, Germans are completely underrepresented. So only in three cases do media reports actually say that someone is German. Um, so here is structural racism as a model. I have 10, I've taken 10 Germans and 10 migrants. And so we can see that Germans are underrepresented, even though maybe one in 10 is a criminal in both groups of population. But the core problem is that non-criminal migrants are basically invisible in our society. So if I go to the media and want to be inform myself about media, uh, about, uh, about, crim about crim criminals and criminality amongst migrants and asylum seekers, then that obviously leads to a skewed picture because I will only read about crimes being committed by migrants and not hear about any of these other people. Um, a while back I was having a beer with a jurist um, who spontaneously uh, used the term of uh, structural uh, incitement of hatred. Um, because, for instance, if someone says uh, all asylum seekers or all refugees are criminals, that's ma incitement of hate. But if you only talk about, crim uh, about migrants who are criminals, and that's structural incitement of hate. Some examples of racism from my own childhood. So a book, um, this song is extremely and deeply, deeply racist. Um, ten children die, um, they have accidents, they shoot each other, they want to steal something from a farmer, um, and after nine children are dead, then um, another woman finds the child um, and has ten more children. And um, that's deeply racist, so the question is, is this about children or is the author talking about bugs? Um, Otto Walkes, a German comedian, we all laughed a lot um, about him, but I cannot laugh about his racist jokes anymore. Um, reporting in the media in the 70s and 90s, especially cover pictures for Spiegel, an important German weekly. Um, I found a quote um, that said basi that basically goes, quote, cities such as Berlin, Munich, Frankfurt can, can barely deal with the invasion anymore. Um, they're starting to create ghettos. This was about Turkish migrants to Germany. Um, another question is, where did Doc Baum get his uh, plutonium in Back to the Future? Ah, well, from Lebanese terrorists. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger obviously was dealing with Arab extremists. Um, Indiana Jones, he's not racist, right? Oh, well that kind of has several stereotypes. Um, in his movies, Arabs are always lazy and are always in the way. But one thing that really grabbed me is that Indiana Jones' task is to go to other cultures and grab their cultural treasures and bring them to Western museums. That's basically what we were talking about with Nefertiti earlier. That's basically colonialism, but culturally. And that's extremely mean, because once you start looking into racism, you start realizing that it's everywhere. And it really is undermining movies that you used to enjoy. And Disney, Disney can't possibly be racist, right? Well, um, Aladdin, um, to, in addition to the fact that the evil Arabs obviously have big noses, and all his friends kind of look like uh, Latino teenagers from a US college. But the really crazy thing is the original song um, the intro song was originally about the or was originally about the origin of Aladdin. Um, it says if you, they cut off your ear, if they don't like your face, that's barbarian. But hey, it's home. After public pressure, Disney changed the song, and that's interesting to see how many racist stereotypes you can find in the last century. Um, Arabs are allegedly lazy, primitive, criminal, they're terrorists, um, but at least they're only Hollywood cliches and stereotypes. But we know that's not true. And then there was um, September 11, which was almost ready for, Holly for Hollywood in a movie from Hollywood. People were traumatized. People were watching all of this in TV. The perpetrators, all Muslim men, all young, violent Arabs. And then there were additional terrorist attacks in Europe. Um, I'm sparing you the pictures, but I'm showing you pictures of the memorials here. And again, there is reporting, all of them young Arab or young Muslim men. 
The question is, what does that do to a society if for decades we only pu always push the same narratives about, with regards to the media, but also with regards to um, Islamic terrorism? In 2012, there was a study about uh, the German society um, with regards to the quote, Muslims and their religion are so different from us that it would be naive to demand a same access to society and to all positions in society for them. Um, and 27% fully agree with this and 30% somewhat agree with this. So the question is essentially get, like getting at racism. It's asking, it's asking, do you think people should be excluded based on their religion and their belief? Uh, and more than 50% agree with this. So that means racism is not a corner case, it's something where more than half of the people uh, in, in Germany have racist and uh, Islamophobic ideas. Yeah, but I mean the sentiment is, well, the Isla, uh, Islam is far, far away, and then there was the war in Syria, and we see a lot of young men, and they look like the terrorists we've seen before, and the religious uh, monitor of uh, the Bertelsmann uh, uh, Trust is, uh, says uh, about half of the people we asked um, think uh, that Islam is a threat, it's more in uh, East Germany, and apparently a lot of people see Islam not as a religion, but they see it as a po political ideology, and that means th uh, they're excluded from religious tolerance. They see um, the debate and the media reportings um, are a reason for that, because they put Islam into a context of terrorists. So. That means racist fears are a mass phenomenon in our society. Uh, so more than 50% uh, are afraid for uh, Islamization or for, uh, um, are afraid of the Islam. So what are the effects of so many people having those ideas and feelings? So if you think about it, so if people are really, really scared um, of of this religion, so they they go with metaphors like a flood of uh, uh, people claiming uh, asylum, uh, a flood of refugees, mass um, immigration, invasion. So that means people are metaphorically formed into a weapon, and it dehumanizes people and uh, legitimates violence in the end. So now. Now, there, of course, are people who are trying to uh, work against that, but they are um, talked about as traitors, as left fascists, as left-wing bullshit people, um, as do-gooders, social justice warriors. Um, and so, and we have this idea of the press lying, of this all being fake. So, these, those narratives are completely illogical because they only appeal to emotions. People are in panic, they are afraid or in fear, and they're using those those narratives. Um, and then one effect, effect of that is hate speech. Um, people think about this as verbal self-defense. So. If you look at Miss Shipley or Miss Hayali, which show with what kind of flood of hatred and even death threats uh, they are confronted, they are not only focal points as a person for people uh, who want to conduct a hate speech, but they also have a background, they look like they have a migration background, and so that's what makes them a target. And then there's a lot of people who um, are really in, in this fake news world and conspiracy theories world, and that makes those people a target. And I deeply, um, deeply solidarize with them. So, of course, with the targets, yeah. So, people who have racist fears are immune to logical arguments because they are on an emotional level. So, um, to say, um, I'm afraid of being in hates. Uh, uh, no one could put me on this bridge because it's a glass bridge and no one could even drag me uh, on this because I would be so afraid. And so, this fear of walking on a glass bridge is completely irrational. But if someone now tells me, well, it's certified, it's completely safe, you can absolutely go there, it's a logical argument, but it doesn't help me with my fear of hates. So they had to drag me over the spirit. So 
That's a problem because if someone is actually in fear or in panic, um, it doesn't respond to logical arguments. And it doesn't work uh, to call people with racist fears uh, Nazis. Because they are not yet Nazis, but uh, at the time Nazi is just a prejudicative um, term without actual good content. So if someone tells me about his racist fears and I tell you you're a racist and you're a Nazi, um, they say, okay, you're just did you value that. So um, on a psychological level, we say they have a cognitive dissonance. So people with racist fear actually um, act against their own values and the effects of that is, okay, I could look at my fears, but I could just find a strategy to circumvent that. For example, here are some examples. So um, your fear is being directed to different causes. So Zorjatsi was called me a Nazi or the contradiction between uh, what I say and what I do um, is played down. Um, yeah, um, it's the idea of I'm being obligated to act uh, in a racist way. Um, or I just simply deny what's happening, like fake news in the press, and uh, I just select my uh, my information and interpret my information selectively, um, so that it doesn't uh, so that reduces my cognitive dissonance. So that's that's a very very interesting picture, because that's an um, empty bus with empty chairs. But it looks like uh, women uh, wearing a burqa, and people are actually seeing this in there. We were laughing about this, but there are people who are actually that panicking that they actually see bus see empty bus seats as burqa. So. People with racist fears n actually need those fake news for uh, their self-confidence. So the ma uh, massive fake news in the social media is not the problem, it's a symptom of what we see. And people with racist fears are very vulnerable to conspiracy theories. For example, if you say that our the federal chancellor has a plan of getting immigrants into the country, um, you also find anti-Semitic um, conspiracy theories. So that's a plan of Jews, of Jewish people to get Muslim people into uh, the country. So, but what happens if in Germany there's 20 million people with racist panic or racist fear as well? Uh, they take to the streets, so you see uh, Pegida, patriotic Europeans, they're serious about fighting against Islamization of, um, of Europe. They really believe this. And they w would like to elect someone um, who represents them, uh, but they cannot find a representation because um, those party would um, have to contradict the basic law, but there is one party uh, called uh, Alternative für Deutschland, the alternative party for uh, Germany. And so in the names of other party, there's something about their value system, like a Green Party or a Socialist Party. And so that's um, something that's not attractive for uh, racists, but having it, this alternative, that's something that appeals to them. So Bert Lucke and Frau Kepetri that you see here, uh, they left the party because of their turn to right-wing extremism. And there were, have been warnings um, 2000, in 2015 already about um, uh, extremist movements in this party, uh, which have not been dealt with. And the interesting thing is that we have a symbiosis of two powers here. We have conservative people here and right-wing extremism in there. So the conservatives, they say, well, the right-wing extremism is not that bad. Um, I just threw away uh, a quote here, uh, but it basically says we have no right-wing extremism in our party. And the right-wing extremists, um, they are their part is to uh, get the votes, to get the people to vote. Because um, when people say, well, um, AfD right now is in the parliament, is it part of established parties? No, it's still very, very extremist people in there, and that makes them attractive for voters. And that's a symbiosis that only works in this interplay. 
So you see people who left this uh, party tried to found their own parties. They didn't work. Only the symbiosis here makes it work. So let's look at the international uh, part. So if you look at the Western society, so what's reality and what is the idea of having Muslim people in the country? So in Germany, we have 5% Muslims and people think it's more than 20% of um, people living in the country. So in almost all countries, there's a great overestimation of how many uh, Muslim in there. So then let's look at what connects the uh, voter bases of right-wing parties or right-wing extreme parties. And they have uh, the very same opinion when it's, uh, it comes to immigration. They're wi widely different party. Um, but when it comes to racism and to immigration, they have to say, share the same ideas. So those parties have um, uh, constitute a platform for voting potential uh, from the right-wing and right-wing extremists. So um, if you look at the Brexit, then we also have um, um, Muslim ra race, uh, uh, racism towards Muslims uh, as part of the Brexit campaign. Then in France, um, uh, 84 year old men attacked a mosque from Front National, and especially the immigration, said the press. Uh, the Front National in France uh, is warning of Muslim immigration. Netherlands, um, there's also from the right wing party a warning there is Islamization. You have the same thing in Italy, Lega Nord in Italy. So we don't want any immigration from, especially from Muslim and African countries. That's what they say. If you look at the USA, uh, you have the Muslim ban and you have the, well, how do I call that? The racist wall that he built and a lot of people did not understand why do people elect someone and just don't seem to recognize that he is racist and the thing is they don't elect him in spite of him being a racist. No, they elect him because he's a racist. So if an impeachment would remove Donald Trump, the racist potential, potential in society is still there. And at that point, um, people would maybe would look back and say, well, Trump was an idiot. Um, so he, he wasn't clever enough to, to, to break all of the things or uh, didn't establish fascism. That might be something that we should could see in the review. Uh, rear view. Um, you might remember the <laughs> chancellor debate. Um, most of half, more than half of the time was about terror, Islam, migration and deportation. Obviously, you can also indoctrinate people and make them believe that this is an important topic by simply covering it um, highly well. Again, structural incitement of hate, um, something that especially appears in the Bildzeitung, um, which is an important German tabloid. Um, I scraped the 20 most read Bild articles in October 2019. Out of the 20 most read articles, six are about um, criminality by migrants. Um, there are none that portray migrants in any particularly positive picture. And then even the other 20 most read ones are articles that essentially push this AFD alternative for Germany right-wing narrative. The Greens are losing money. Um, the Antifa is putting our um, freedom into danger, is in danger our freedom. At this point, the former editor-in-chief who worked for the Bild for 10 years now calls the Bild a, par a de facto par organizational part of the AFD, this far-right party that I was talking about earlier. So basically all these narratives that the AFD is using, a lot of these, they didn't even develop themselves, but all of a lot of these narratives existed before and they simply had to grab them from the built, built newspaper. So we really have to say that Western media have failed. Um, they have basically been instrumentalized by terrorist propaganda. Terror is not a military strategy. It's something that's a communication strategy. And it tries to generate spectacular pictures that works. You need to generate clicks. We know this from when a famous person, a celebrity, takes their life, then you need to be really careful um, because if, if you report on it too much, then there are people who imitate the suicide. Um, so in this case, why don't you do that? We should maybe be doing the same, right? Because if you say you report on a terror attack, then you need to kind of put a caveat. We know that this is supposed to scare you, but don't be scared. M media have basically been practicing structural incitement of 
hate for years. Um, they make money with this. I don't want to generalize here. I want to use a few examples um, of media that actually do a really good job of this. For example, there's the NDR, a North, like a North German uh, public broadcasting service that did a really good job of interviewing refugees. Um, Spiegel Online, the online version of the Spiegel, uh, had an article on celebrities that used to be refugees. Um, there was a Tagesspiegel, a, new, um, a newspaper uh, in Berlin, which produced one edition that was entirely produced by people who were refugees. Um, there was another uh, uh, radio feature as well that was also about racism. What? How does our government deal with this? There is a program called Live Democracy, initially created by the SPD, the Social Democratic Party. It has around 1 million euros for different civil society projects that work against racism and far-right extremism. Um, for instance, an exit program for neo-Nazis, but that was supposed to lose some of its money in 2019. Um, there was an attack in Halle in October 2019 um, a few hours later, this uh, this was an attack against the synagogue. Um, a few hours later, the government changed its mind. Um, there are here are a few examples from the CDU, Merkel's Christian Democratic Union. Um, there's Robert Moritz, who was a far right extremist. There's Christina Schröder, um, who often gets attention for her far right positions, where she says essentially claims that Muslim men are generally more prone to violence. Um, for, sometimes claims that this is related to their norms, claims that they're hard to integrate. The, she wanted to cut financial support for and for measures against right-wing extremism. After the National Socialist Underground was blown up in November 2011, it became very clear. Um, it became, became very clear that the, there was a far-right terror organization, and at the, at the time, the German minister was trying to take the money away. But after it came out that there was right-wing extremism. She had to like she had to stop cutting money for them. Um, the young union, which is the young person's uh, arm of the CDU, wants to take money away from the Amado Antonio Foundation, which works against anti-Semitism. The CDU wants to undermine associations that are working against far-right terrorism. Um, for the longest time, they only tried to support research uh, that only looked into Islamic terrorism, but not into far-right extremism um, until very recently. We can't wait until people die. First, we need to start looking into this. But right now, the way it works, people die, and only then is money being given into research. Bettina Kuda is talking about how people are being replaced, kind of like this great replacement rhetoric. Um, Kai Wigner says that saving people in the Mediterranean is a cap service. Um, Joachim Hemmann used the N-word um, on German TV. Um, Hans-Peter Friedrich from the CSU called people who are demonstrating against the AfD um, left-wing fascist. Uh, other people, Soda from the CSU is talking about asylum, ter uh, asylum tourism. Tum uh, Thomas de Maizière is talking about people who refuse to integrate. Um, Andreas Scheuer from CSU says that uh, once you have a football playing um, Senegalese who has been here for three years, the worst thing is that you can never get rid of him ever again. And then Jens Spahn, also from the CEU, said we are we have more in common with the AfD than with the SPD. Thank you. The Western society has a mass phenomenon, mass phenomenon, phenomenon of Islamophobic racism, and we don't want to see it. Instead, we deal with the symptoms. This is something that I try to portray as a graphic. So, racism is a mass phenomenon, possibly pushed by or probably pushed by international terrorism and unreflected, uh, very one-sided reporting. It's further exacerbated by politicians who essentially normalize racism and want to use this as a tool to gain votes. And in addition, this is exacerbated by structurally racist reporting that kind of confirms racism. Again, I uh, propose to use the term structural incitement of hatred. And this mass movement has all of these uh, results, such as hate speech, uh, hate speech, threats of murder, fake news, echo chambers, AFD and Pegida, and right-wing extremism. All of these are consequences. Of course, we can do something against hate speech, but the real problem is mass racism as a mass phenomenon, which is the core root of the issue. And since I have a bit more time, I want to use another Another example, there was the case of Wächtersbach, where an extremist tried to shoot a ma man from Eritrea. Afterwards, there, someone researched where this man came from, what his social environment was, and so he obviously had a pub where he went regularly, where they reproduced racism on a daily basis. The attack in Halle, where a man tried to enter a synagogue, and in his background, 
a background story, had an interview with his mother who also has anti-Semitic positions and anti-Semitic views. And I think that's really interesting because we're talking about radicalization online because we can look at it online, but what we can't research as easily is radicalization um, at home or radicalization in your favorite pub that you go to every day. That's essentially invisible. And just because we can see it online and on the internet means that's not, that doesn't mean that it's the internet's fault because racism essentially comes from within society. Four, four reasons why we all need to pay attention to racism now. This, these are the bad news. Um, only if you look into racism can you recognize it and do anything against it. One thing that I noticed before started looking into this, when I was confronted with racism, I often didn't recognize it. And in addition to that, I was lacking the document, uh, the arguments to essentially mark, mark it as racism, because I was lacking this deeper understanding of the underlying mechanisms. Secondly, only if you start looking into racism, can, can, can you also recognize it in yourself? This is a really bad, this is really bad news for you. Once I started looking into this, I also started realizing how many racist stereotypes I have myself. And only then can you start questioning the, and get, getting rid of those racist stereotypes that you hold. Now, is really bad news, white people profit from racism, whether they want to or not. Um, so next time you end up in a police check, um, or if a police check that's doing racial pro profiling works past you, you profit because it hits someone else, or when you get an apartment and not someone instead of someone else, or if you get a job instead of someone else who has a Turkish name. In every single case, you profit from racism and you benefit from racism. Um, and not seeing racism is part of structural racism. If you ignore racism, you're part of it. For decades, I had the benefit of being able to say I didn't know. I could say, ah, I didn't know, I wasn't sure that there was structural racism, I didn't know it existed in society. I just didn't know, I'm sorry. And the bad news is, well, I just took that innocence away from you. Um, and so I confronted you with, uh, well, now if you continue to close your eyes, you're participating. Thanks for this very, very interesting talk. We have a couple of us. So, and before we come to the questions, um, just your translators were F.L. Berger and Y.T. Chen. And now we start with the questions. So, maybe I'm going to meet Christina Schröder. Uh, what are we going to tell her? Or what do I say if she says something or if she doesn't say something that I can talk something to her? But if I can talk to her and initiate a uh, um, uh, talk. That's a good question. That's incredibly difficult. I think there's two levels which you have to talk about. The one is what can you do against racism? That's not an easy topic, especially once people have gotten lost in a world of racist anxiety. Um, I mean, we can't give 50% of the population in therapy for anxiety. The second thing we can do, and I think that's the most important thing, is to question all of these structures that support structural racism, especially structures that per continue to perpetrate these racist narratives. Christina Schröder um, is also the um, racism, or used to be the expert for racism and extremism, quote unquote, and this within the CDU. So maybe a conversation with some researchers might be sensible for her, um, maybe um, getting informed yourself um, might be a good basis for talking to her uh, once you encounter her, especially with regards to her statements about Muslims being particularly dangerous or particularly hard to integrate. So next there's a question from the internet. Yeah. So an RC there's a couple of people who are atheists and they have uh, a lot of uh, debates about circumcision of boys. So where is the borderline to racism here? How do you discuss it without racism? That's incredibly difficult. We know this topic that there are several military actions by Israel and it's hard to criticize them without being called an anti-Semite or ending up in the same position as an anti-Semite. And that's incredibly hard and I'm sorry but there's no easy answer. But yeah, it's just very hard. Um, but to date I was La I was missing a dis debate about this, which would be the necessary basis for getting to a solution. There might be no solution to this, there might be no easy answers, but yeah. 
Next, there is a question from the microphone four. Hey, uh, that was a great talk. Thank you. And well, thinking about the, your T-shirt. Um, so for us uh, potato Germans, so I was surprised and it changed my view. So we're talking about 20 million people uh, are in uh, racist panic or fears, but we also have 20 million people uh, with a migration background who are also in fear or sh uh, could be in fear. And in the debate, we're not talking about their, their emotions, um, and we're talking about the potato Germans and fear. Yeah, the invisibility of people who are victims of racism is, um, but is an important part of structural racism. Um, they're not being listened to, you're not giving them room to speak about this. There are several programs. Um, there's, for example, the um, Half, Half Potato podcast. Uh, which deals a lot with people from different backgrounds and they really make jokes about how once they want to fly somewhere for two they need to arrive there two or three hours early or need to get rid of their beard because otherwise they will be racially profiled and cannot go on their holiday and for them in some cases that's almost normal and being confronted with that I think is incredibly helpful. So, um, Halbe Kartoffel is an important recommendation. Mashallah by Katrin Rönecke is also a very good podcast um, um, because there are different formats that essentially deal with people and empower people who you could meet any at any point in time. Um, those people finally get an opportunity to talk about racism. And I think that's the important thing to ha be able to um, be aware of that. Next, there's microphone seven. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks for the talk. So at, um, at the end you said, okay, when you don't see racism, you're a part of it. And at the beginning we're talking about cognitive dissonance. So I, uh, my question is, how do I help people to see that and to accept that there is racism? As I said, that's hard. We're really missing, we lack, we ha there's a lack of solutions and tools. Um, confronting people could maybe help. Um, for instance, um, inviting the family, but that's really hard. I really don't have any solutions, to be honest. One thing I was concerned with in the first place is what are these phenomena, um, this slant in politics, um, in reporting, that's where I wanted to, sh wanted to, where I saw racism as a mass phenomenon. What, I, what to do against that? I really don't know. Um, maybe there are people who know more about this than me and who can talk about this. But one thing I can really advocate is that we need to stop, essentially, further exacerbating this racism. So we have time for one question. Do we? Yeah, okay, number four. Hi. Um, did you think about in your research what role um, school and education play and how we could, um, at this early stage, uh, how, how, how does um, manipulation happen there by teachers, by media or by in the schoolyards? Well, uh, this uh, research into pubs, families, the social environment is extremely hard. Heidmeier is also a scientist of education, um, so uh, is also a scientist who basically re researches um, youth culture and youth education. And I know anecdotes, but I'm not aware. I, I don't think it can be researched systematically. And obviously what you see there are things that kids also bring into school from home. So I don't know anything more specific about it. Okay, is there, are there more questions? Yep, okay. Yeah, you said that um, everyone's raised when you take a job or you take, uh, you can get a flat that uh, because someone is being discriminated in that process, well, that means everyone is racist. But um, what uh, what can I do about it? What can anyone do about it? Uh, being racist by yeah. But what what can you do? But take a flat. Well, I'm not saying you are racist just because you accept the apartment. Um, the point from which onwards you are a racist that's really hard to say. But what I want to point out is that you benefit from racism. 
So if you're a white person, you profit from structural racism, and as long as you're a man, you pro benefit from structural sexism. That's something that I really wasn't aware of before. Only once you start looking into this, um, and once you hear uh, victims talk about how they're being made invisible, only then are you being confronted with this. And that's why I can only recommend to everyone, even if the degrees to which you benefit um, are incredibly small, you're still automatically part of the structure because it's structural racism. Um, and that basically creates an obligation for all of us to uh, inform ourselves. Okay, next, there's a question from number one. Yeah, first, um, I, uh, uh, I think it's not, it's not bad if, the, if, if Christina Schröder, the mini former minister, makes problematic statements. The second is, um, well, is it a problem that we, uh, uh, that things we want to change in our society, we always have this war rhetoric, if you want to fight uh, racism, if we want to um, if we want to kill racism or uh, swipe out or something. So I think that people who are dealing with racism, um, they have this... Uh, I think it's difficult for people to deal with uh, or to accept that there is racism when this rhetoric is there. Oh yeah, I think that's very clear. Um, a lot of things are escalating as well and are mutually reinforcing each other as well. Um, when someone is, says that your family, your family is racist. Um, then I might, when someone is saying something racist, I might also say, "Oh, you're voting for a fascist party," even if it's not really his fault. Um, basically, it's completely irrelevant whether I managed to convince him or not. But my anger also is then projected onto this other person, and which is why it's incredibly hard to discuss these things. But at the moment, we're not discussing these things at all. So when you meet with people over coffee or beer, then sexism or racism. Uh, it's not really something that you talk, talk about on a regular basis, even though so many people are affected by it, and that's really sad. Okay, next, there's a question from number seven. Uh, I would like to say to the whole topic, uh, to Boka Ogata and her book Exit Racism, um, Racism Critical Thinking, I would like to recommend that, and I would, uh, would be uh, interested in more recommendations. Yeah, that's very good. Uh, I also read the book. There's an incredible wealth. The only appeal that I can make to you is we need to talk about racism more. Um, I'm not really prepared to actually do that myself right now. I can only say this is what we've observed for over the past few years. Those are the effects of that. And so what we do now and what we can do ourselves I didn't even start talking about that. That's not even part. That's kind of part two. Okay, next, there's another question from another microphone. So thanks again for the talk. Um, I have two things I would like to say. So first is I have a migration background. I'm living in Germany. For, I have lived in Germany for 10 years. And I am a lot in a lot of discourses, and it's divided. You know, people with a background in immigration, uh, they talk on their own, and then you have the Germans um, discussing this separately from us. So racism is not only a white uh, phenomenon. Of course, there's racism in immigrants, and I think that um, that has a social economical background. So what job do I have? Well, how man, much money do I have? How much money have I uh, got from, have I inherited? And those elements are, uh, you know, I think we should talk more about this. And what's your opinion on that? And why are those elements not, not in this talk? Yeah, I also noticed that um, I was at several events, for example, in a university environment that only affected university students um, or in activist context that uh, were discussing this, but that the kind of like whole of society discussion is missing. I mean, I have this forum, and so I used my opportunity to discuss, a, to bring up this topic here, but I really think it has to become bigger. Yeah. I don't know whether that helps. So, we had yet noch. Okay, we have time for one final question, number three. Okay, oh, uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to say something to school and how things um, start there, how uh, discrimination incites there. 
So I don't know how it's in Saxon. So, so, so my children are lucky or unlucky in a Bavarian um, grammar school. There is a school service, a Christian school service, and that means that children go with their teacher to the next church, and of course only the children of Christian belief. All other children have to stay at school and do something else. And I see there's, um, you know, they have this uh, structural divide in there, in grammar school even, in children, uh, by saying, okay, one religion is, well, maybe superior or at least has a special status. And personally, as an atheist, I also feel discriminated in this regard. And I, I just wanted to give this as a hint how, in, even in grammar schools, kinder are, uh, children are indoctrinated. Yeah, as you, uh, you, can, you can see, once you start seeing this once, you can see it everywhere. You notice it everywhere. Okay, thanks again. Thanks again for the questions. And there's a big hand again for Michael. And from the translation team, if you want to say hi or want to say something to the